My name's Robert Melaloo. I'm going to be the MC for this evening. So if anything goes wrong, I get to be blamed. That's how it works around here. Tonight we have a wonderful opportunity to dig deep into PR. We've got some big experts that are back there moving wires around. And we should be able to answer just about any question you have about PR and first past the post and, and even some electronic stuff that we've got back there. We're actually mixing Macs and PCs, which is not a good idea. Our keynote speaker tonight is not Kelly or I. He has been a member of parliament for the riding of Skeena, Bulkley Valley since 2004 federal election. He is currently the NDP critic for democratic reform, serving as the vice chair of the 2016 special committee on electoral reform, which recommended a federal referendum on proportional representation. Drawing from comparative and historical experience, he will explore what electoral reform will offer British Columbia while challenging some of our most popular myths about both our current system and our, our proposed proportional system. Please give a warm welcome to the Honourable Member of Parliament in Skeena, Buckley Valley, Nathan Cullen. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, well, well, first of all, um, thank you for that warm welcome. And, uh, sorry? Would you like me to turn my mic on? I, I don't know how to do that. He's uh, muted. <laughs> that was. <laughs> He's got two mics on. It's only the one. <laughs> Let's crack into this. So I'll skip a lot of this because the next folks are going to talk about this, which is great. You're going to be asked two questions. One is the mandate question. Do you like the current system or do you want to switch to a proportional system? If that question receives more than 50% of the vote, then uh, we move to the answer of the second question, which is a choice between three proportional voting systems. They're all quite different, and I think I'll, I'll speak to them quickly, but I think the next presentation will speak to them in more in detail. Dual member, mixed member, and rural urban proportional. Between October 22nd and November 30th, anyone's Canadian citizen, 18 years of age, and you live in BC, if you're registered to revote, uh, you'll receive a package by mail. Um, yeah, let's talk about first past the post for a second. That old chestnut, it's uh, been with us for a while. We invented it, well, in the 1200s and is a fairly uh, efficient way of voting if you have two people running. Because it's intuitive. There's two of you running, everybody casts a vote, and if you get one more than the other person, okay, I guess you're more popular. Gets more complicated when there's three or four. And Canada, our parliament, recognized this problem 100 years ago and conducted our first parliamentary study of changing the voting system because there were more than two parties presenting in our federal elections. And in good parliamentary tradition, we didn't do anything about it. <laughs> Traditions are important. There, first past the post is very good at a couple things. One is it's dead simple. It's relatively easy to understand. Y'all vote, and whoever gets one more than the next person, they win. It also does a fairly good job at representing geography it connects a person to place. This is the Kelowna representative. This is the Penticton representative. That's its two main advantages. It's got some disadvantages, and this is what you gotta weigh out when you think about what you want. It doesn't produce the proportional share of votes. So parties, we just saw this in New Brunswick, uh, a so-called wrong winner election. The Liberals got 39% of the vote. The Conservatives got a little over 31% of the vote, and the Conservatives got one more seat. And a lot of New Brunswickers were saying, how's that even possible? And we say, it's more than possible, it's actually, it just depends on how the votes spread out. And yes, we've had wrong winner elections in BC, we've had them in Canada. The other significant problem is that a lot of votes don't go, well, more than half of the votes in Canada don't go towards electing anybody. Votes are cast, but they're not represented in Parliament in any way. Now, we all know that voting is an irrational exercise, right? There's, there's, it's very unlikely that my single vote is going to determine the outcome of the election. 
our collective votes are what determine it. But we don't go into the ballot box expecting this is the golden ticket. I'm making the choice as to who's going to be the MP or the MLA. Yet, collectively, that is the expression of our voice. And I run into a lot of voters in a lot of parts of this country, when you're not talking to them at the doorstep or in town halls, who say, ah, it doesn't matter. I have voted in 15 elections. And my vote has never counted. It's never gone towards electing anybody. It becomes a truly irrational act to vote for somebody who you almost can guarantee is not going to win, depending on where you live. Because if you're living in southern Alberta, and you can be the best gosh darn liberal or green or New Democrat voter you want, and steadfastly go out there and vote for your candidate, the odds are not very good. And yet we vote anyways. Too many of us don't vote. And the problem with not voting isn't just that we get turnouts of 60% or 63%, is that when people don't vote, people don't pay attention. And when people don't pay attention, things like corruption set in. Because politicians can tell when people don't pay attention. Hmm? Because we're not held to account the same way. First past the post um, also rewards those that are very good at dividing voters into little micro groups. Because the math is not hard. If you want to form a majority government in Canada, you need about 38 to 40 percent of the vote. That's of those who voted. If only 60 percent turn out, that means you have to focus on about 25 percent of the electorate. And you can pick off 25 percent of the electorate by policy and your spending in a very, very efficient way. And with social media and micro-targeting, that's only getting worse. What's the problem with that? Well, 75% don't count because you're not important to that party's target audience. That's a real significant problem. It rewards those who are good at conflict and those that are good at parsing off the electorate into little tiny pockets. Proportional systems reward those who don't mind cooperating from time to time. If you're the kid that just cannot hang out in the sandbox with anybody else, proportional voting stinks because it very rarely leads to majority governments. It does, but you need to get more than 50% of the vote to get it. And in federal elections in Canada throughout since Confederation, we've had two true majority governments. Twice out of all the elections we've had has a government achieved a majority with a majority of votes. It doesn't happen very much. It's hard to do. It's hard to do at a riding level. It's hard to do at a national level when you have more than three or four parties running to get that popular. Yeah. So um, we've seen these little pie charts. Here's what happens. 40% of the vote, 44% of the vote in this case, BC 2013, translates into about 60% of the seats which in a British parliamentary system leads to 100% of the power. That's the problem, right there. Because when parties know that, in a British parliamentary system, a majority government is a fearsome thing. If you have the majority of seats, oh boy, decisions can fly through. We have more whipped votes, more controlled voting in Canada than almost any other democracy in the world. We're quite surprising Canadians sometimes, aren't we? We think of ourselves as collegial, get-along types. Our voting system leads to such strange vagaries. When we have Europeans come visit, they can't believe we're still doing this. They're shocked. Really? Why not? Why haven't you gone some, like, to some other system? And we say, well, just tradition mostly. <laughs> so proportional, and, and for those of you that are really deep into this, you know, my apologies. What it, a proportional system tries to do is translate the will of the voters as accurately as possible to the outcome of the election. Let me say that again. It attempts to translate the will of the voters, the expression of the vote, as accurately as possible in the number of seats achieved. So if a party gets about 20% of the vote, they get about 20% of the seats. That's generally the goal. Radical, I know. And some people find that complex and hard to understand, mostly because they're used to something else. We want votes to count. We want people to vote for what they want to vote for. Anyone ever heard of strategic voting? Strategic voting says, who are you most terrified of? 
Who do you dislike the most? Once you've identified that, now you pick the person most likely to stop them. And you say, well, but I want to vote for this. No, 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 sorry, I know what you want to have, but you can't have it. It's like walking into the restaurant. They say, what do you want to eat? And I say, spaghetti. And they go, yeah, but what do you really hate? And I say, well, well, I've never been a big fan of liver and onions. Well, in order to not have liver and onions, we need you to have the soup. And I said, I'd rather have the spaghetti. They say, yes, yes, but if you actually have the spaghetti, you might end up with liver and onions. Do you want to take that chance? And I go, gosh, I really don't like liver and onions. I guess soup's okay. And then at the end of the meal, they come and say, how was dinner? And I say, well, it was okay, but I was really looking forward to spaghetti. Oh, but remember, it wasn't liver and onions. So you should be happy. Now would you like to give me a tip? It doesn't leave a great deal of satisfaction for a lot of voters. And some don't go back for more. And again, this rewards those that are able to divide. These are, this rewards those that are able to scare the poop out of people. Look at this terrible thing, hidden agendas and under sweaters and stuff. It, it, it rewards those that are good at that. It does not reward those that say, hey, all parties have something to contribute. You know, there's a lot of complex problems here in Canada. No one party has all the solutions. You'll not hear that from a politician in a first-past-the-post system. You are not rewarded for that kind of talk, even though that's true. What I just said was true. So why not we reward the truth a little more often, rather than just looking across the aisle and saying, these folks are evil. So vote counting. Vote counting is important. Uh, these are some proportional countries, Sweden, Denmark, New Zealand. When you tally up their votes and how many of their votes went to actually electing somebody, this is what you get. In BC, uh, around half of our votes don't count. Should I go through the voting systems or do you guys want to crack at it? You've got videos? Oh, well, they've got videos. There's, there's dual member. That's what the ballot's going to look like. There's mixed member. There probably won't be that many candidates, but you're given two votes, a riding vote and then a party vote. Some of these, the decisions over how the ballots are going to look and other things come later. The maps have not been produced either, and I can talk about that. The second vote is the top-up vote. So you have your local MLA, which is one of the myths we have to do away with right away. Those who are arguing against uh, the change are purporting this idea that you lose a local representative. None of the voting systems here have you lose a local MLA. So we just put that to the side. The other one was that this whole process is not constitutional. That's also not true. It's just been tested in court, and what we're doing is constitutional. Who knew? Um, and then there's a rural-urban voting system, which is what it is. The, the way rural folks vote is slightly different than the way urban folks vote yeah, under this system, which is one that actually came out of the federal process. Jean-Pierre Jean -Pierre Kingsley, former Chief Electoral Officer of Canada, came up with a version of this. Because rural voting realities is sometimes quite different than urban voting realities. And as a rural representative, I can speak to that. New Brunswick just had that wacky election. Suddenly, uh, the New Brunswick, is he still premier? Well, for now. He's the premier for now, who had done a commission to study on changing the voting system, which had recommended to change the voting system. I bet he's a lot more interested in that now than he was before. PEI had a referendum, which passed for a mixed member proportional. The premier got up the next day and said not enough people voted for it to be valid. His polling went down 15 points the next week connected to that and some other things. And now PEI is going to have a second vote on changing their system. The Quebec election is on Monday, two days. In Quebec, all of the opposition parties uh, have committed to bringing in proportional representation if they form government or a part of government. And Ontario is kind of wondering what just happened. Because <laughs> uh, they got this new guy in who uh, really didn't seem to like city council in Toronto all that much, and then proposed the notion that it was appropriate to use what's called the notwithstanding clause, which exists as a federal and provincial power, that does what? What does the notwithstanding clause do? It does what? It overrides the Supreme Court. It overrides the charter. It overrides charter rights. It doesn't get used that much for a good reason. It's never been used in Ontario. 
because uh, it's, it's the nuclear bomb of, of government action. And changing the composition of a city council and using the nuclear option seemed to be a bit dramatic. And what worried some of us is that the premier said, I'm going to use it again. He didn't end up using it because he appealed the decision at court and won, which is the normal human way of doing things in governing. But now Ontario suddenly has a resurgence of interest in having a voting system where someone can't do that if they only acquire 40% of the vote. So all that to say that we have our vote here in BC in the fall. We have New Brunswick happening, PEI, Quebec, and suddenly a resurgence of interest in Ontario. That, that, that prime minister office fellow who stopped me on Spark Street that said, this issue is dead and nobody cares. I thought he might be wrong at the time. Increasingly, I, I believe he is wrong because we're looking at our politics. And a question I would put to people is if you're satisfied with the way politics is running in this country, then stay with the status quo. If you want better, expect better, then entertain the option of something different and that your vote might mean more and people might feel more accountable to you as the voter. And that image of that Heisler chief standing there, maybe, maybe because it's something that we could see in our parliament. I would very much look forward to that day. I'm gonna stop talking. Thank you very much.